All right. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. Uh, this is Chapman University's financial aid information session. My name is Cristian Aguilar, one of the associate directors of admission here at Chapman University. And I'll pass it over to, to David. Hi, everyone, and welcome. Uh, my name is David Carnavali. I am the assistant vice president for undergraduate financial aid. Um, I'm so glad you're all joining us today. Um, from my office, we have a couple of folks um, that you'll be hearing from behind the scenes. We have uh, Jonathan, uh, who is an assistant director. Um, he works with outreach efforts and uh, diversity efforts within our office. And we have uh, Erica Ruffalo, who is a senior counselor. Gladys Sanchez, who is a counselor in our office, and Chauncey Sosa, who is a compliance officer. She works a lot with student loans um, and helping students through that loan process. Um, I am going to go ahead and move over and we'll see the presentation in just one moment here. Okay, <clears throat> so you should be seeing the presentation and Christian, can you just confirm when I'm looking at it on my screen, it looks like it's pretty small. Yeah, it looks pretty small on our side as well. Okay, let me just adjust that real quick here. Sorry about the technical difficulties here, folks. It doesn't look like it's adjusting sizes, so we're going <clears> to <throat> hope that oh, it's can, showing up here. I can pull it up, too, if you need me to, David. Let me know. Okay, <clears throat> we're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, as you're going through this journey on the admission process and you're making decisions about which university to attend, um, you're obviously looking at Chapman University. Um, <clears throat> and one of the things that you're gonna be considering is financial aid and, and the affordability of the university. Um, things that we're gonna cover today um, who we are and what we do in the financial aid office. Um, we're going to look at our tuition financial aid, the application process, and some deadlines, some frequently asked questions. And at the end, you'll have a chance to use that Q&A feature on your Zoom and ask questions. And uh, we'll either be answering them live or uh, my team will be responding to those questions as well and getting those back to you. <clears throat> so let's just start off on, on who we are and what we do. Um, we are the Undergraduate Financial Aid Office. We're located in the Bethal Student Service Center. Um, if you're familiar with the campus, we're directly behind the Fowler Law School. Um, we are open Monday through Friday uh, from 9 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. and then 1.30 p.m. to 4.30 p.m. And the fastest way to um, ask a question or schedule an appointment with us is to shoot us an email at finaid, F-I-N-A-I-D, at chapman.edu. Um, that is a monitored mailbox. It gets answered by real life people. And um, typical turnaround on that is gonna be probably within the day, depending on the time of day that you submit the question and how busy we are. Um, but most of the time we're able to get that to you within a couple of hours of you submitting that to us. So what does a financial aid office do? Uh, we re receive the results of your FAFSA. That's your free application for federal student aid. We generate your various awards. Um, we coordinate with the federal government and the state government, um, any private foundations where you might have scholarships coming in from. And we put that all into one document for you to look at. We make sure that your uh, awards are up to date. 
Um, we process and disperse those awards. So money is going to come in uh, essentially to our office and then we release it to your student business account, um, which is your bill. Um, and so it goes through our office into your billing account. We process loan applications. So any loan applications for the university are going to come through our office and we assist students with scholarship hey, David. searches. Yes. Just going to pause. It's uh, the, the uh, screen is freezing on this side. It's not catching up. Okay. Christian, do you want to go ahead and see yeah. if you can load yeah, the most presentation definitely. on your side and see if that yep. helps? Yeah, most definitely. Let me pull that up real quick. Okay. Can I get the, uh, a thumbs up from folks? Can see my screen here? We absolutely can on our side. All right, sounds good. <clears throat> so we should be on about slide six. Um, there are a couple of things that we don't do. Um, our office, our, our folks in the admission office as well, we do not generate your bill. Um, that comes through our Student Business Services Office, SBS. Um, we don't generate a payment plan. That also comes through Student Business Services. And we don't process any payments in our office or through the admission office. Um, we also do not provide proof of enrollment. So that comes from our friends in the registrar's office. Um, <clears throat> so really, we're, we're dealing strictly with financial aid. Um, and you know, we are always happy to guide you through to what office you need to speak with. Um, and we can coordinate if it's something that needs to be coordinated between the two, we're certainly happy to, to do that for you. <clears throat> so let's look at the moment we've all been waiting for, right? The tuition and financial aid information. <clears throat> um, this is the tuition for this academic year, for the 23-24 academic year. Um, and when we look at financial aid, when we look at tuition, we are looking at it year by year. Um, so the tuition will be set shortly for the next year, uh, which is the year that most of you are gonna be uh, applying for, for the 24-25 academic year. Um, but currently we're looking at tuition of $62,400, um, some student fees in there and housing and food for first year students. Um, <clears throat> grand total there is about 80,182 is what we estimate out at. Um, in addition, you're going to have things like book expenses, personal expenses. These are kind of indirect costs that we um, <clears throat> that we don't deal with from a billing standpoint. Um, they're costs that you're in control of um, versus the tuition and the student fees and the housing and the food are, are things that are standardized for the, the student population. So 80182 is kind of the base number that we're starting with uh, when we're looking at financial aid and, and the cost of the college. We can move on to the next slide. So you have that $80,000 and, and we wanna know what tools do we have in our toolbox to help pay this bill? Um, certainly the first is a college savings plan. If you're fortunate enough to be able to have a savings plan, um, those would be 529 plans. Um, they may vary by name in, in different states. Um, so, you know, be aware of that. Um, any other savings or monthly income that you're dedicating towards uh, payment for of the bill. Um, and then obviously there's financial aid and that's one of the biggest tools that we have in our toolbox. Um, and that's why we're here is to help you figure out what you're gonna qualify for, um, make sure the, the application process is as smooth as possible and help you to get that bill settled. We can move on to the next slide, there we go. Um, so when we're talking about financial aid, we are talking about multiple kinds of financial aid all under the same umbrella. So we're looking at grants and scholarships. Um, <clears throat> we're looking at work study, student loans, parent loans, and private loans. All of this falls under the category of financial aid. And we're looking at essentially one application process for all of these types of funding. Um, <clears throat> the funding is gonna come from multiple sources. It's gonna come from first the university. Uh, it's also gonna come from the state, from the federal government, and from private foundations. Um, so we're looking at the same application process for all of these things. There's not necessarily a 
one particular application that you're going to fill out for work study, one particular application you're going to fill out to see if you qualify for a student loan, one application for scholarships, one application for grants. We're doing all of this under the FAFSA, as well as your admission application. Um, so that's really important. We're not asking for any supplemental information from most students. We can go ahead and go to the next slide. You're going to be behind a, a little bit on the pictures there. That's fine. When we look at financial aid by the numbers, <clears throat> um, the average financial aid package for this current year was about $31,000. Um, and that was in grants and scholarships, basically what we call free money that didn't include the student loans in there. Um, and overall, we awarded about $193 million in grants and scholarships from all sources um, to students at the university. So there's definitely financial aid available out there. We should just make sure you qualify. And that's what we do in our office. <clears throat> when we're looking at where money comes from, um, I like to put this chart up so that you can see kind of who's contributing to a student's education when they're applying for financial aid. The largest chunk of the pie there is the university. So 59% of, of the financial aid dollars coming in for students is coming from Chapman University. Um, versus if you look on the federal and state side, uh, it's about 3% on each of those. Private scholarships are about 1%. Federal loans um, are coming in on the student side, or student and parent side, about 28%. Private loans, a little bit smaller, 3%. And work study is much smaller in there as well at 3%. Um, so you can see the university really is investing in our students. We believe in our students, we believe in their success, and we want to make sure we're, we're tackling those barriers that you might have. So the application process, as I said, we're using one application. Um, we're going to be using the FAFSA form, the FAFSA, um, along with the admission application to determine what you're going to qualify for. Christian, we can go to the next slide. There we go. <clears throat> um, there's three types of financial aid that we're going to be looking at in this application process. The first is our merit scholarships. Um, these scholarships are based on your admission application. Every single student is reviewed for merit scholarship consideration. Um, the due date for the application is going to be the various due dates for admission, whether you're doing early action, early decision, regular decision. Um, those are the, the deadlines to, for that. You will actually find out if you qualify for a merit scholarship at the point of admission. Um, so as part of your admission packet, um, you will receive your letter that says, congratulations, you've been admitted. Um, and you might receive a second letter that says, congratulations, we are offering you a scholarship, and it will detail what that scholarship is. <clears throat> um, on the other side, we have departmental scholarships. These are also called talent scholarships. Um, these may require a little bit more work for the student. So it might be a creative supplement or an audition or a portfolio. Um, and this is for consideration for money from the individual departments based on your major and based on your supplemental materials that you've submitted. Um, there are, again, it's, it follows in line with the uh, admission deadline, although some of the departments may notify you a little bit later um, whether or not you're going to qualify for the scholarship as they're reviewing uh, application materials such as your portfolios and your auditions. All of the other financial aid is need-based financial aid, and that's going to be based on the FAFSA. Um, you're going to fill out your application for admission. You're going to fill out the FAFSA, which is the federal form. And we're going to get that information and we're going to look at it and see what grants and scholarships, work study, student loans and parent loans you're going to qualify for um, from the federal government, the state government and the, and the university. So we have some deadlines. <laughs> um, in a normal year, I would be able to tell you hard and fast, the FAFSA opened up on October 1, we have some deadlines set in place. Um, the federal government is experiencing some delays in the uh, opening of the FAFSA this year. So in a normal year, October 1 is when the FAFSA opens. Uh, we encourage all students to submit their FAFSA information um, sometime within that October month so that we can have that information ready to go. This year, the federal government is telling us it should be open sometime before January 1st, and that will be sometime in December. We are anticipating that it will be uh, towards the end of December based on the information that we're hearing. 
So we are encouraging you to submit that as early as you can. Um, <clears throat> we're not gonna be able to offer you a financial aid package until we do have that FAFSA submitted and ready to go. Um, students who have completed the application process for financial aid, you're gonna receive your um, financial aid offer shortly after you've been admitted. So we were not gonna send that out to you before. We do need to have that admission acceptance in there. Um, and then we'll be able to send that out. Uh, the admission office will keep early action and early decision folks um, up to date on any kind of deadlines or changes that would be due, uh, changes due to the delayed release of the FAFSA. Uh, so your admission counselors and your admission team will be making sure that you get that information um, for the early action, early decision. The later opening of the FAFSA really won't affect students who are applying for regular decision and some of our transfer students uh, because we're looking at, at those awards going, or, or those admission decisions coming out you know, beginning in March. So FAFSA should be settled by that point. Um, again, to get your financial aid offer, you have to have the FAFSA completed. The results have to be valid. Um, so if you've left sections blank, um, or if the information is being questioned by the federal government, we may have to, to delay getting that to you until we've cleared that up. Um, and that no additional information is needed. So sometimes the federal government will have us uh, double check a couple of things before they, they verify that the FAFSA is actually accurate and ready to go. Um, <clears throat> if it's income and asset information that they are asking us to verify, uh, we can still get you out a preliminary financial aid offer pending the receipt of, of verification documents. Um, if it's identity or citizenship uh, information that they want us to verify, we are not gonna be able to generate that offer until we do verify that identity and citizenship, okay? Remember the FAFSA is used um, for um, US citizens and eligible non-citizens uh, to apply for need-based financial aid. So you don't need to fill out the FAFSA for the merit scholarship consideration or the talent scholarship consideration. So again, who fills this out? US citizens, eligible non-citizens. It determines your eligibility for federal, state, aid as well as aid from the university. Um, you're gonna fill this out at fafsa.gov or studentaid.gov, it's the same website, it just redirects you to a different spot. Um, right now there's gonna be some banner headlines on there that tell you that it's not quite open for this academic year coming up, um, so we know that. You're gonna be using uh, information, tax information from the 22 tax year for the 24-25 academic year. So we're looking at uh, income information that's two years ago, asset information, and everything else in the FAFSA is as of the day you sign it, and you sign it electronically. So a couple of things about the FAFSA. You don't need to wait to be admitted to apply for financial aid. Um, we encourage you to be going through the process at the same time. Uh, and the reason we say that is that we wanna be able to get that offer out to you as soon as possible. And the soon as possible point is at the point of admission. Um, so if you wait to fill out the FAFSA until after you've been admitted, um, there's gonna be a significant uh, lag time between us being able to get you that information at the time that you were admitted. Um, and you won't receive that until you are admitted. So we wanna make sure that we have everything waiting, basically so that the financial aid office is kind of the last, um, we're, we're just kind of waiting on the admission office to get that award out to you. Um, we would rather have that happen than us be having to, to reach out to you to make sure that we're getting that information and that you filled out that FAFSA. So it's always better to have the FAFSA kind of sitting, waiting, and then once a student has been admitted, that's the trigger for us to start to review it and get the information out to you. So part of the delay, or actually the, the only reason for the delay this year in the FAFSA is that we have a new FAFSA form. So if you have siblings um, or moms and dads, if you're out there and you have other students who have filled out the FAFSA, you're gonna know some significant changes this year. Um, we can go to the next slide and I, I kind of outlined some of the bigger changes here. Uh, the first is that there are significantly fewer questions on the FAFSA this year. There's uh, estimating that we're under 40 questions. It should be somewhere in the mid 30s. Um, so on the previous FAFSA, there were about 136 questions. That's going to be down to about 30 questions, which is a good thing. So it should be much easier to complete, much faster to complete. Uh, there's also a little bit different way that you access the FAFSA. So uh, what's gonna happen is that your students uh, will go ahead and start their FAFSA form. It is their application, so it starts under their name. And then they will invite collaborators, which will be 
parents to input their information separately into their FAFSA form. So it's not like you can sit down at the computer at the same time and go through item by item and, and put them in. Um, the student's gonna fill out their demographic section, their income section, then they're gonna invite uh, the, the needed parent to go ahead and do the same thing. And it can be in a separate session. Um, <clears throat> the parent and the student are providing consent to the Department of Education and IRS to give us their financial information into that FAFSA um, and it will come over automatically from the tax returns. So you're not putting in a lot of financial information in there, um, unless for some reason the IRS doesn't have access to that information right away, um, then you may need to fill out a paper FAFSA or input the information directly into the FAFSA form online. However, um, when you're completing the FAFSA, it will let you know if you need to do that. That's not something that you can request ahead of time. Uh, there is much easier access to the IRS information. So if you're familiar with the previous FAFSAs, um, you kind of had to play a game of mother may I, where you said, I want to do this. The IRS said, are you sure you want to do this? You say yes. And then the Department of Ed says, is it okay if we take the information from the IRS? And then you say yes, and then it comes in. This time when you log in, you're providing consent and it's automatically happening for you, which is a good thing. Another good thing is that we're expecting an increase in federal Pell Grant eligibility, federal grant eligibility in general. Um, so the way they're looking at that income information is changing a little bit. Um, so we are expecting to see a, a pretty sizable difference in uh, Pell Grant eligibility across the board. Some specific changes to the FAFSA um, that we do need to, to address because they do affect you if you had uh, previous students uh, filling out the FAFSA, but also the definitions have changed a little bit from what we've been using for the past 30 to 40 years. Um, parent information. So on the FAFSA, we are looking for the parent who provided the most financial support for the student and that parent's spouse. Um, that may be a parent who the student does not live with. So we are looking for the most financial support. If it's equal, financial support is equal down to the penny, then it's the parent who earned the most and that parent's spouse, okay? Uh, child support should be considered when determining who provided the most support. Um, so for example, uh, in a situation where mom and dad are divorced and dad provides child support and that child support is more than 50% of the student's financial support, uh, the father would then be providing the most financial support for that student. And the father's information, the father's spouse would be the information that we need. It sounds a little complicated, but there are there is a new parent wizard where students will ask the will answer questions that are provided on the FAFSA, and it will say who, according to the questions that they've asked, should be filling out the FAFSA parent information. Um, if the parents have are married but uh, filing separately then both parents may need to be collaborators. Otherwise, one parent, uh, if, if it's filing jointly, one parent will need to be the collaborator. Um, informal separation is no longer accepted on the FAFSA form. Um, so for example, in, in many states, like in California, um, parents can separate by moving out of the house and saying they are separated, um, or they can fill out an actual form with the um, with the county and the state that says we are separated. So in that scenario, the federal government is saying that they are only accepting the formal separation, not an informal separation. If the parents are not married, but live together, then we do need both parents information. So that definition has stayed the same. Parents without social security numbers can now get the FSA ID, which is how you sign the form. Your student will be getting one. Most students are gonna get theirs through their high school counseling office. Um, typically it, it becomes an assignment and maybe a civics class or, or something like that. Um, but parents will also need to do that and parents without a social security number can get that as well. If you haven't done that, it's not an issue. Um, during the, the consent and collaboration process, you'll receive details for how to get that FSA ID. It's a very simple process. 
<clears throat> um, the business and farm definition have also changed this year. So this is really important. Um, there used to be a, a limit on the size of a business that needed to be reported. Um, the definition has changed to any business or farm regardless of the size. Um, so if you have a one person business, um, it's a home business, we do need to know the value <clears throat> um, uh, minus any, any debt on that value. Um, it is important to remember that the value is the market value of all as assets minus the debt of that business or farm, not the entire debt of the family. So when you're doing your valuation, you can only use the market value minus the debt on that particular market value or that particular business. Um, assets might include things like computers, company cars, phones. Um, if you're familiar with your own tax returns, um, it, it gets a little complicated, but it, a lot of the value and the, the asset of, of the small businesses are some of those things that you're writing off on those business write-offs. Um, so you want to make sure that you're, you're looking at the, the value of your business. Um, <clears throat> you know, even if you're a lawyer practicing from home, you might have a computer, you might have other assets that are specific to the business, you would want to include those as, as value. Couple of frequently asked questions. Um, we can move on to the next slide here. Um, how will financial aid office communicate with my student? Um, in, in two ways, um, we will be communicating directly with the student in most cases. Uh, we are happy to answer questions from parents. Uh, we do that all the time, but I can let you know, once we get to a certain point in the cycle, um, students do have a right to privacy and we are expected to communicate only with that student. Um, students will receive a university email uh, even before they have accepted their offer of admission. <clears throat> and once they have that university email, that will become the official form of communication that we will use uh, to communicate with the student. <clears throat> um, can I get a bigger merit scholarship? We get this question quite often. And um, your merit scholarship is determined at the point of admission. So the, any document that you submitted to be considered for admission is what we're gonna to use to determine the merit scholarship. Um, if for some reason uh, you do have, you know, you're gonna have your seventh semester grades, which may not be submitted yet because seventh semester has not been completed, um, work with your admission counselor and they can look at that and see if submitting those helps your application. Um, we don't guarantee that there is any change in the merit scholarship. Um, but they can certainly look at it and see if it helps the application or if it's going to hurt your application. Um, do we offer athletic scholarships or scholarships for athletic participation? No, we do not. Um, that's something that we actually cannot consider um, due to the NCAA guidelines. Um, <clears throat> we make X amount of dollars. Should we even complete the FAFSA? Regardless of what that X amount is, um, I, I would say, yes, you should complete the FAFSA. The FAFSA completion time is fairly quick. And what that does is that gives us the information we need to determine if you qualify for anything. Um, if the only thing that you qualify for in financial aid from the FAFSA is going to be student loans or parent loan, you don't need to accept those. But what filling out the FAFSA does is allows us to have kind of a baseline for you. And if for some, some reason something should happen, um, maybe you're doing, your family's doing just fine and then mom and dad both lose their jobs. We hope that doesn't happen. Um, in order for us to help you, we would need to have that FAFSA on file to see what you qualify for. And in a situation like that where both parents might get laid off within a short time from each other, if there's no FAFSA on file, um, we have to wait for you to complete that in order to see where we can stand and what, what we can do to help you out. So we always really encourage students to complete that FAFSA every year. You do have to do the FAFSA every year that you want to be considered for financial aid beyond the merit scholarship and the talent scholarships. Um, so do that every year. It gets easier each year because most of the time you're just selecting renew my FAFSA, updating a couple of fields and sending it off to us. And then it's there just in case. Or if you decide that maybe this year we do need to take out the student loans. Um, you need to have that FAFSA on file. Is my financial aid package guaranteed to stay the same each year? Um, this is a yes and no question. So things like your merit scholarship and talent scholarships, as long as you're meeting the criteria, those will stay the same. They do not increase and they do not decrease. Okay, that's important. They don't increase, but they also don't decrease as long as you're meeting the requirements for those scholarships. 
On the merit scholarship side, it's a 2.75 being enrolled full-time at Chapman, completing 12 units each semester with that grade point average. The talent scholarships, um, those typically have some participation agreements um, that you, you'll get the, each one will have a little bit different categories. You get those from the department when they award them, they'll tell you exactly what you need to do and how active you need to be in the department to get that scholarship. Um, your need-based financial aid, because it is need-based and because you have to fill out the FAFSA every year, that is subject to change. Um, and it's gonna be changing, you know, it can change up or it can change down depending on the family circumstances and um, what happens with family income and family assets. Um, so if you know mom gets a huge raise, that's going to be reflected in the financial aid package the next year. If mom loses her job, that would also be reflected in the financial aid package. So it does work both ways there. Um, but what if the financial aid, the FAFSA doesn't reflect your financial situation accurately? You do need to answer all the questions on the FAFSA as they are being asked. Don't try to second guess or update it with information that may be accurate today that wasn't accurate based on the two years ago information, right? Um, then you start to work with our office um, and, and you're gonna file what's called an appeal. Um, we have a specific form that you need to fill out. We ask you for a letter of explanation and documentation supporting any of the information that you're presenting to us. Um, it may include also the current year tax return information, um, so we have a better idea of what's been going on. Um, but generally, we're looking for things that are unique to your situation that impact your financial situation. These are generally things that have happened within the last 12 months. Um, typically, you know, we're not looking at things that happened five or 10 years ago. Those are reflected in that FAFSA. Um, but we're looking at things that are very unique to your situation, and generally, they're not dealt with in the initial financial aid calculations. Um, so we're, you know, those are the kinds of things that we're looking for. So we might be looking at things for, you know, extraordinary medical expenses. Um, if a student or a sibling had surgery and there was a large out-of-pocket component of that for the family, we would want to know that and see if that impacts your financial aid. Um, <clears throat> yeah, we can go on to the next slide there. A couple of things about appeals. You always want to talk to our office first. Um, we will be able to walk you through whether or not we think this is going to impact your financial aid package, what kinds of documentation you might need, um, give you kind of a general idea of what to expect in the appeal process as well. Uh, one of the things that, you know, in our office, the, the hardest thing is when we kind of get an appeal form sent into us that's, we're kind of getting it blind and we've never heard from the student or the family before. Um, because we haven't been able to guide them through that process. And we haven't been able to, to make sure that, you know, what they're submitting actually does impact the financial situation and that we can accept that. So, for example, if a family were to submit an appeal without talking to us and it dealt with credit card debt, that's not something that we can consider. So, unfortunately, that would be an appeal that would be denied, but we could have actually stopped that kind of up front and let you know, you know, you're welcome to submit this. However, we can't consider credit card debt, we can consider things like uh, medical expenses, um, but we can't necessarily consider, you know, regular prescription expenses or co-pays, but maybe we're looking at those kind of one-off expenses. Um, we can't look at mortgage payments, other college offers we're not looking at, the students' qualifications, um, we're, we're not considering those in an appeal. We're not looking at things that happened more than a year ago, um, because those things are reflected on the FAFSA. The best time to appeal is after you've received your financial aid offer. Um, that way you know exactly what you're appealing. And we may come back to you and say, okay, what are we looking for? What, you know, how, what are your expectations of how we can help you? Um, and you, we, you know, we can kind of let you know, this is basically what I'm seeing is, you know, maybe you had about $5,000 in medical expenses. It's not really impacting anything. Um, so we don't necessarily want you to go through the full process without that. And that form will not become available until after January. Um, since you can't fill out the FAFSA earlier than that, as far as we know right now, um, there's really nothing we can do with an appeal form if it were to come in earlier, uh, other than just kind of sit in our files waiting for you to be admitted and waiting for the, um, the FAFSA information to come in. A lot of what we've been talking about is for US citizens and eligible non-citizens. We're gonna switch gears right now into our international students um, and what financial aid you might be eligible for. 
you're still going to be eligible for those merit scholarships and those departmental or talent scholarships. Same deadlines apply. It's with the admission application. Um, same criteria as far as creative supplements, um, the admission application, the audition, the portfolio, things like that. So those two are remain completely unchanged. Um, students will be reviewed for those. We also have what's called the Delphin International Student Scholarship. Um, this is also something that is reviewed by the admissions team uh, at the point of admission um, and based on the financial statements that you do submit um, for visa consideration. Um, so that's what you're going to be looking at from the uh, international student side of things. Um, there are some loans that are available from private lenders uh, in certain situations for international students. Uh, sometimes they may need a U.S. Um, eligible co-signer, um, or they might be limited to their final two years of study as well. Um, so that's the type of financial aid that you're looking at. <clears throat> and I think we can stop sharing the screen there. We're going to invite Jonathan to come in, and he's going to help me <clears throat> kind of moderate some of the questions, and we're going to answer some of those live. Hi. Um, so a lot of reoccurring questions uh, pertains to merit scholarships, average amounts, the cap, um, renewal of them, criteria of renewing um, merit scholarships. Great. Um, our, our merit scholarship tops out at $40,000 for the upcoming year. <clears throat> um, the renewal criteria for scholarships, uh, merit scholarships, is a 2.75 grade point average. Uh, completing 12 units at Chapman University um, and enrolling full-time. And that's 12 units per semester, so 24 units cumulative. Um, students can also use our uh, inner term to get units and to help boost their GPA. We review students for their GPA and the units completed once a year, which is at the end of the spring semester. Um, so that January inner term class, which is um, the tuition is waived for students who are full-time in both the fall and the spring is a good way to boost GPA, get extra credits, um, and kind of accelerate your program. Because if you do the interterm class, uh, which can be up to four units that are waived, um, if you're doing that, that's going to give you an additional semester at the end of three years. Um, you basically had 12 units that you didn't pay for but that were free that help boost your GPA and get you a little bit closer to graduation a little bit faster. Thank you. We also have a question, um, couple questions about the residency requirements and whether or not someone local on campus is required to live on Chapman Housing. So the policy of the university, and um, Christian can step in here as well, is that all first year students do need to live on campus. And I believe it's a two year uh, residency requirement. Students can apply for a waiver if they live within a certain radius of the university and they are going to be living with their parents or a relative. Um, John, uh, yeah, no, that's raising. correct. Yep, yep. No, the only thing I'd say, yeah, if you're residing within a 30 mile radius of our university, you are eligible to opt out of that housing arrangement. There is a form you would have to fill out. Um, there is, David, also something that families need to alert your team, I believe, if they originally applied for on campus housing. Uh, that they need to fill out if they're moving off campus as well, correct? Correct. So um, we're going to assume all first year students are going to be living on campus. Um, if that's not the case, you can let us know. Financial aid packages can change because of campus uh, on-campus housing. Um, so if students are moving off campus, moving in with uh, family, um, your financial aid package um, is a little bit different because you don't have those other associated costs of the um, campus housing and the campus meal plans. Um, question about FAFSA changes, um, about the number of children in college and how that impacts FAFSA in the future. Great question. Um, the FAFSA does still ask for the number of people in the family. It does ask for the number of people in the family who are attending college. Um, unfortunately, that does not impact the calculation on the FAFSA. Um, in previous years, it did. In this coming up year, it does not. Um, so it is not taken into consideration in the calculation of financial aid.
for departmental scholarships awarded, um, how often are they awarded and what is the typical amount of money which would be offered? For departmental scholarships or talent scholarships, um, they are awarded um, to first year students and transfer students. So they are awarded, um, <clears throat> they're not awarded throughout the student's program. So they're awarded once in the beginning when, they, when they're admitted. Um, and then the student can keep qualifying for that based on the participation. Um, amounts for scholarships depend on the priorities of the department. Um, they can range anywhere from $1,000 um, up to five or $6,000. Um, in, in some cases, um, if we have foundation partners who have given money to departments, it might be in the, in the ten dollars to $12,000 range, but those tend to be more on the rare side. Um, average is probably between $2,500 and $5,000 for the year. We're getting more housing questions. Um, so is housing available for students transferring as juniors? So transfer students and why there is a two year housing commitment? Those are great questions. And unfortunately they kind of fall outside of our um, purview in the financial aid office. Um, so I'd encourage you to um, attend a residential life uh, Discover Chapman event, and they'll be happy to help you out with those kinds of questions. Um, our admission team can also help you out getting you connected with residential life if you do have questions about that. Yeah, there will be some residential life sessions happening during Discover Chapman events. So folks, I strongly encourage you to register for some of those. Uh, you're you know, happy to ask any of those types of questions that you might have for the two-year housing residency. We have questions on full ride scholarships, um, which, so can we talk about a little bit about the mission driven awards chairman offers? Sure, um, we do have a couple of scholarships um, <clears throat> that are very specific programs. Um, and in, in some cases they are um, geared towards students at very specific high schools where we have partnerships with, um, and they receive a, either a full ride scholarship or a significant portion of that. Um, <clears throat> and that, that's a local high school, Orange High School. Um, we do have one of those agreements. Um, I believe it's four students each year, five students each year. Um, we also have some uh, foundation partnerships uh, where we do offer full scholarships that include tuition fees, room and board. Um, and those are <clears throat> um, through our women in entertainment program, uh, which are some foundation partners. And then we do have a program called our um, Orange County Heritage or OC Heritage Program. And this is a program that covers uh, tuition and fees for students who are gonna be living at home um, within Orange County. Uh, and they're meeting certain uh, uh, income requirements. They're meeting certain um, merit scholarship requirements as well and qualifying for the federal Pell Grant um, and the California Cal Grant. Um, so students who meet all the qualifications for there um, receive tuition fees covered if they're gonna be living uh, with their parents. Thank you. We have a question about parents' personal financial information and will that be um, accessible to their students when, when filling out their FAFSA application? Uh, that's a great question, and the answer is we are assuming yes. Um, this is a new process on the FAFSA. In previous years, we can say that yes, that information is available to the student um, because, again, it's the student's application. So they are able to log into their FAFSA form at any time and review that information. Um, I know this can be a hard thing for, for families, and this is really you know, the time to talk about to your students about responsibility, um, that they do have greater access to data about the family and how they how they use that data and what's acceptable and what's not acceptable um, <clears throat> in, in reviewing that data. Um, there really is no way around it because the parent, the student does have an absolute right to view their own uh, financial aid file that's guaranteed by them in the federal regulations. Um, <clears throat> part of that as well, uh, of that same conversation is talking to students about access to information because it goes both ways. Because they do have a right to privacy, um, that doesn't mean that a parent can walk into the financial aid office and automatically get information or walk into our registrar's office and see what the student's grades are. 
Um, so we do highly encourage families to have that discussion about what information the student is going to release to the parent, um, what they're going to have access to, that we do have a form that, that students can fill out and they can adjust this at any time that specifically says who gets access to what information on campus. Um, I can also tell you that the only times that we are allowed to, um, to kind of violate that request is if it is an emergency. Um, <clears throat> that we will notify and, and talk to parents um, as long as they are listed. Um, you know, but if the student has not given us permission to talk to a parent about financial aid or about their bill, um, we're not able to do so. Um, so we encourage families to have that conversation that, that, that it goes both ways. You're trusting the student with your financial information. They need to trust you with access to their grades or access to their bill and their financial aid offers. Thank you. There's several questions about early action applicants and how that aligns with the FAFSA deadline. So as we said, as, as of right now, it doesn't um, because the FAFSA, the early action deadlines are you know coming up, your applications are coming up for early action, early decision. Um, we're gonna try to get financial aid offers out uh, as quickly as we can. Um, we, we do have some things in place to be able to make sure that we can get you at least a very good estimate of financial aid. Um, we'll be communicating with families um, as that as that comes up. Um, but once the FAFSA is available, we recommend early action, early decision. Students complete that FAFSA right away. Um, and then Christian, I believe we have extended out the early action deposit. Is that correct? Oh, the early decision? Yes, it yeah, will not. Early decision. Yeah, early decision students that are offered admission to the institution do not have to submit an enrollment deposit until two weeks after they have received a financial aid package. So it will be as of that date and not of when you hear with an admission notification. Thank you. Our answers are being, our questions are being answered, but um, let me see. We have a very specific question. Can you still qualify for financial aid if you owe back taxes for 2022? Historically, um, yes, you can still qualify for financial aid if you owe back taxes. Um, so the important thing to remember is that it's the student's application. So if you know, if, if things that are happening to the parent don't necessarily impact the student's eligibility when it comes to things like bankruptcy or <clears throat> um, back taxes or fines or things like that, um, because that's not the student's eligibility, overall eligibility. Um, so as far as we know, under the new FAFSA, that should not change. Um, if you owe back taxes, it shouldn't impact the student's uh, availability for financial aid. Um, things that it might impact is your um, access to your taxes. So sometimes when there's you know back taxes that are that are being paid, um, we often see that there's extensions on the next year's and the next year's and the next year's tax returns, um, so that they're not adding to those back taxes. Um, but those tax returns do need to be filed so that we can get that information and, and determine eligibility. Great. Are foundation scholarships like women in, in entertainment the same as talent scholarships, or are they something we need to apply for separately? No, those foundation scholarships are not talent-based scholarships. Uh, there is a talent component, but it is not something um, that you actually apply for. Um, those are um, just like the, the um, Simon program, which is for students in a very specific high school and a very specific portion of that high school. Um, things like the women in entertainment program, um, these are students who are participating already and have been participating in a program in Los Angeles County um, called the Women in Entertainment Program. <clears throat> um, so it's not something that can be applied for. And at this point, if they're not part of that program, they're not going to be considered for those scholarships because these are students that are continuing to work um, at work with advisors in, that, in those particular programs. 
I see a couple of questions around merit-based scholarship as eligibility, what goes into it, weighted or unweighted. I want to kind of just tackle this for the folks that are asking that question. So there's one that says AP or IB classes. Is that viewed any greater? Uh, you know, it goes as we review applications for admission based off of many different variables, but when we're looking at GPA, we do weight at GPA for both admission as well as for scholarship. Our average for admission and scholarship is about a 3.8 on a weighted scale. So we are looking at those IB high level classes, that IB diploma for students that might be taking that, an AP course here and there. Uh, make a note that we are looking at the letter grade and not the IB exam or the AP exam score that you have received uh, in order to be considered for it. Uh, there's other questions around, again, the weighted or unweighted. Again, we're looking at the weighted side of things. But when we're <laughs> reviewing for merit-based scholarship, is not just GPA-based. Is GPA rigor in, cur in your curriculum and then the quality of your application, right? So somebody who's maybe worked on the application a day before it's due – you know, the quality of the application is not going to be there, right? And, and this may sacrifice a student's chances of being considered for a merit-based scholarship. So definitely spending time on that applic application. Thank you, Christian. Um, as he mentioned, if a student does not meet a 3.8 for GPA, slightly lower, it does not eliminate him or her from being accepted to the university. It's a whole picture. Correct. Right. right. That's our average 50 percentile, right? I mean, we ask students above and below that GPA average. It's a holistic review process. Uh, there's many other things. I just, we, we typically give that as a baseline to say, you know, for admission as well as for scholarship. Yeah, there's a lot of um, IBAP admission related questions and those can be directed to our fabulous admissions team. Um, Christian, can you help? Yeah, What's, what are some of the questions? Uh, well, the, your email address and who to contact. Oh, absolutely. Those specific questions. Yeah, I'll plug in our admission teams contact information here. So if folks do have any questions, you can reach out to our admission email and we can get you in contact with the right individual, depending on who your admission counselor is. So it's just admit at chapman.edu. Mm -hmm. uh, so admit at chapman.edu is that uh, email address to reach out to if you have any questions around IB, uh, weighted, unweighted, things like that. Thank you, Christian. Um, David, we have another question about um, collaborators and access mm -hmm. to financial information. Sure. If um, to, to guardians, parents um, are, are chosen as collaborators, will the other one see the other um, financial information? Um, that's a great question. We don't know. Um, we don't know where that stands right now. Um, in, in previous versions of the FAFSA, yes, you logged in and you could see every question on the FAFSA when you logged in. We don't know if that's gonna be the case. There shouldn't really be a case other than uh, parents who are living together but not married where estranged spouses would be both required to fill up the FAFSA. So <clears throat> for example, in the case of a divorce, if student lives with mom, but dad provides the majority of the financial support, mom is not listed on the FAFSA nor has access to it. So dad and dad's spouse would be the collaborator on the FAFSA. So it's not just every parent is a collaborator automatically. It's the parent with the most financial support and their spouse. And the only reason two parents would need to be collaborators is if they <clears throat> are married, filing separate, or are unmarried and still living together. Thank you. There's a question. My son is waiting for a screen card. Um, does, does he have any other way to access funding? So is there funding for 
undocumented students um, or someone who is waiting for their green card? Uh, um, it, it's a little bit of a nuanced question because it, it, uh, you know, waiting for their green card doesn't necessarily mean undocumented. They could also be on a visa of some sort. Um, so we'd really need to know more information about that. Um, generally speaking, if you cannot fill out the FAFSA, um, which a student who is not an eligible non-citizen would not be able to fill out the FAFSA, um, then <clears throat> you would be looking at those merit scholarships and those talent scholarships. Um, in some cases, uh, students who fall under the DREAM Act would be in California, would be filling out the California DREAM Act application. Um, and that application would open you up for funding from the state, um, similar to our Cal Grant program. And then we do put additional funding on top of that as well. Uh, I'm seeing a lot of questions still about departmental scholarships and, and uh, what departments have scholarships. <clears throat> um, when you apply for admission, um, you're gonna indicate your major, your potential major, um, your information will be sent to those departments um, to see what types of scholarship funding, if they have money that they can, um, <clears throat> that they can offer you. Um, so th again, that's an automatic process. The, the talent-based uh, programs like creative writing, um, acting, screen acting, those are gonna have the aud audition component to it. Mm -hmm. um, so you'll know about those as well. And if additional application materials are needed, either the department or your admission counselor will reach out to you and let you know what is needed so that you can submit those documents. Yeah, what we always say in our team is, is that, you know, those department funding is really, yeah, just like talent-based as well as STEM-based programs that we offer right at Chapman. So uh, Fowler School of Engineering, uh, Schmidt College of Science and Technology, Crean College of Health and Behavioral Sciences. However, I want to be very, very specific here that you don't reach out to the departments for some of these resources. You're already being considered for those at the time of admission, like David is saying, right? So you reaching out or you submitting a separate form to be considered for something like that, there is none of that there. You're already being considered as you apply for admission. Please be aware that some departments' needs may shift from year to year. And so what they're looking for to award a department scholarship can change from year to year, right? If they're graduating, all of their physics students one year and, and and they need a new class coming in then they may re, they may allocate some of those resources to, to co incoming physics students right but those again shift from year to year so please note that you are being considered uh, along with your application some more reason to put all your best foot forward as you apply um, and just to clarify um, for financial aid consideration we use the admission application and the FAFSA only mm -hmm. um, we do not use the CSS profile mm -hmm. Um, it looks like we have time for one more question. We're at five o'clock and we want to be respectful of everyone's time here. So <clears throat> we'll do one more question or, or one more comment actually from me, I suppose, would be um, <clears throat> we're your allies in this process. Um, so, you know, talk to your admission counselors, um, talk to the financial aid team. We're here to help you out. We're here to answer those questions. You can always get in contact with us at finaid, F-I-N-A-I-D, at chapman.edu. Um, and then Christian gave you the admissions um, email earlier as well. <clears throat> when in doubt, you can copy both emails and we'll figure out on our side who needs to answer the question. And if it's not, um, if it's not one of our offices, we'll get that information for you or put you in contact with the person that can answer those questions for you. Um, so on behalf of the financial aid office, on behalf of the admission office, I want to thank you all so much for being a part of uh, the early part of being a, a Chapman Panther. Um, we look forward to seeing you on campus at some of our other events, and we hope that you have a wonderful evening. Thank you.